praise the Lord with me. Yeah. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth you set your glory above the heavens and the earth when I think of all you made the sun the moon and the stars no praise is high enough to express how great you are. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, mighty God we serve. Oh, angels bow before the mighty God we serve. What a Lord, you're mighty. 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 I think of I think of all you made the sun, the moon, the stars. No praise is high. No praise is high enough to express how great you are. Lord, Lord you're mine. Lord, you're mine. Lord, you're mine.
come on, give God praise for our teens who have reminded us that God is still calling our names. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 18 this morning. As we open our Bibles together, we want to commit ourselves not only to pray, praying, but to prayerful activity as it relates to the police brutality that continues to be inflicted upon African American men throughout our nation. This has been another bloody week, and we know that uh, it is our place to not only pray, but to hold our elected officials accountable uh, to ensure that uh, not only are people indicted, but convicted, and that there are also uh, just policies that are implemented to ensure uh, that these type of killings will no longer take place um, in our nation. It's a terrible place to be when one person can uh, blow up um, and attempt to and harm people in New York City, or when a person can walk into a church and open fire and murder nine people and be apprehended and taken alive. And then a person uh, who has a stalled car uh, is shot because something looked like it may have been a weapon. Uh, so uh, we need some redresses in our nation and our church, of course, is doing all that we can do in this city in order to advocate, we're working with uh, our police department here and, uh, and our um, public officials to ensure that they're continuing to, to address these uh, type of issues, even here in our city of Louisville. Amen? Amen. In Genesis chapter 18 is where our word is found this morning. Beginning at verse 1, it reads like this, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seers of fine flour needed and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. I want to label the message, what's so funny? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What's so funny? 
Abraham has successfully led his tribe in carrying out community-wide circumcision in obedience to the divine imperative that was expressed in their immediate past. Circumcision was the physical expression of their covenant commitment to Yahweh with the benefit of that painful expression of fidelity to God being God's placement of Abraham on the fast track to birthing the nation that had long been declared to be his destiny. Church, it's worth, worth noting that immediate obedience to God's will, to God's way, to God's word always moves God into rapid action. In fact, Immediate obedience to God is so critical that to the inviting of God to move in the lives of his people that scripture exclaims that obedience, in fact, is better than sacrifice. A possible principle of application for powerful discipleship is if ever you find yourself frustrated by what seems to be inactivity on the part of God, you may not need to look in God's direction. But possibly you need to check the status of your own obedience to God, for it is immediate, total obedience that always moves God. Not delayed obedience, for delayed obedience is still disobedience. Nor is partial obedience, for even partial obedience is disobedience. But complete and immediate obedience is what God demands from us. The acceleration of your entrance into your destiny is predicated on your complete, immediate obedience to God. For if you fail to be obedient to God in your present, how will you be prepared for what God has reserved for you in your future? In the aftermath of this great act of obedience, exhausted by the demands of leadership and administration, Abraham reclines under a tree in Mamre and begins to drift in and out of consciousness, quite possibly because after you've done all that you can do in participating in what God is doing in your life and in the world, the only thing left to do after you have responded to God's claim on your life and your energy and your time and your resources is to rest in God and wait for God to do what only God can do. In the words of Howard Thurman, to the man who has found his rest in God, there comes the strength to reduce all the ill at ease to manageable units of control, making for tranquility in the midst of change and upheaval. All that means, it means is that once you have given the best of your service, that you don't have to stress out or become consumed with anxiety as to what the future will hold. But like Abraham, after you have been faithful to what God has called you to do, you can rest in peace anticipation that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Abraham was enjoying a moment of satisfying rest after completing the latest assignment to which God had placed his hands and that is precisely when God pays Abraham a visit. In this instance, God does not reveal himself as the singular voice that arrested Adam in the Garden of Eden asking that pensive question, Adam, where art thou? Neither does God reveal himself in this instance as he revealed himself to Hagar in Genesis chapter 16 as the intermediary angelic-like being who radiated in splendor but spoke like a god. No, here in Genesis chapter 18, God presents himself in the form of three unrecognized visitors. It is the Old Testament expression of the Trinitarian nature of the divine. The God who is one reveals God's self in three persons. At the sight of these three unrecognized visitors, Abraham responded as though he knew exactly who they were. He leaped from his slumber, ran to meet them, bowed, and expressed humility and adoration. Then running into his tent, beckoning Sarah to make a couple of cakes, while he then ran to find a tender calf to give to the butcher to prepare quickly for the visitor's comfortable consumption. They dined, they fellowshiped, they accepted Abraham's sacrifice of hospitality and then after dinner had been served God started speaking this time next year Abraham I'm going to return to you and Sarah your wife will have a son Abraham was silent at God's declaration and understandably so it wasn't the first time that God had made this promise however faintly in the background the sound of laughter could be heard coming from the tent door. Sarah was standing out of sight but close enough to ear hustle. She wanted to hear the conversation that was taking place. Whereas 
Abraham was hopeful at the announcement. Sarah was skeptical, cynical to the point of laughter. Her laughter was not the, care, the laughter of carefree children. Neither was her laughter the laughter, the boisterous laughter of a crowd in a comedy club. No, it was the laughter of disbelief. It was the laughter of a derisive cynicism. It was the laughter that was born from a deep place of disappointment and bitterness. Again, Sarah was in, God was in Sarah's tent, and while God was in Sarah's tent, God made a promise to Sarah concerning Sarah's future, and Sarah's response to God's promise was to laugh. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 does say that there was a time to weep and a time to laugh, but excuse me, my brothers and sisters, when God makes you a promise, that doesn't seem like the appropriate time to laugh. Yes, the promise that God made was astounding and grand and most definitely unrealistic, but this was not just any man who made this promise. God made the promise. This promise was made by the same God who stepped out on nothing and created something, then called it a world. This promise was made by the same God who reached out through nowhere, caught a hold to nothing, turned nothing into something and nowhere into somewhere. The God who made this promise was the same God who took a handful of dirt and blew his breath into it and made a living soul. That God made Sarah a promise and at the promise being made, Sarah laughed. I don't know about you, but I'm astounded Astounded at Sarah's response, you've got to ask, what's so funny? I mean, what, what's so funny about God singling you out to be the matriarch of a nation? What's so funny about God choosing to use your body, no matter the age or the stage, to progress his purposes in the world? What's so funny about God showing up in your house, making grand promises for your life and putting his name on the proverbial dotted line of heaven's promissory note? What's so funny, Sarah? You, you would think that she would have been shouting as opposed to laughing. But ironically, Sarah's faith had become so infected by cynicism that even when God made a promise explicitly for her life, she laughed. It's an intriguing passage because it underscores the reality that if you are not careful, cynicism caused by the disappointments of life will infect your faith to the point that you will laugh in the very faith of in the very face of God with faithless disbelief at the promises of God rather than being encouraged and receptive to God's promises for your life as I read and reflected on Sarah's laughter I couldn't help but wonder if the reasons that some of us have lost our joy and been consumed by nihilism and adopted a pessimistic view of life and respond, respond to everything, even things of beauty with negativity because we like Sarah have allowed our very faith to be infected by cynicism to the point that we theologically believe that God can do it but we practically doubt that God will do it especially for me. Could it be that some of us have allowed our disappointments with life and people and and even with God to have such an outsized influence on our faith and outlook on life that we have come to the place of only giving lip service to the grand promises of faith but we really don't expect God to perform miracles and occasion breakthroughs and tame lions and part red seas and resurrect dead situations and speak through burning bushes and rain down manna and calm stormy seas and dry up bloody situations in our own lives you don't have to answer the question, but I'm compelled to ask. What has cynicism done to your faith? I mean, has it caused you to reject the promises of seeing the goodness of God in the land of the living? I mean, what has cynicism done to your faith? 
as it caused defensiveness to roam the perimeter of your life like bulldogs on a private estate keeping at bay the very people and the very resources that God may be sending in your direction but because you don't get close enough to people to see if they might even be what God is trying to use to bless you because you're still struggling with your unhealed hurt what has cynicism done to your faith? Cynicism polluted the substance of your faith to such an extent that you pray perfunctory prayers, praying only because it is an item on the agenda of your religiosity. So you pray out of duty as opposed to praying in faith. Has cynicism so infected your faith that now you worship out of routine rather than anticipating God inhabiting the very praises of his people? What has cynicism done to your faith? Have you become so disappointed that your appetite to experience God in new and fresh and creative and confounding ways has all but disappeared? Have, have the struggles of life made you so callous that God can sit down in your very midst and you won't even be moved by him? Sarah, what's so funny? Have you become so disappointed that you forgot how to dream? Have the seasons of rain made you forget that beyond every dark cloud there is a silver lining? Have you become so broken that you have forgotten that the one who created you in the first place retains the owner's manual to your very life and is able to put you back together again? Have you lost sight of the fact that though you have suffered some losses that God never leaves us with nothing? Have, have you forgotten that your very existence is testament to a loving and benevolent creator who is always for you? Have you become so accustomed to sickness that you began to question God's ability to heal? Have you become so comfortable in brokenness that you've stopped seeking God for wholeness? So used to upheaval that you don't expect God to cause peace to come into your life? Sarah, what's so funny? Sarah's laughter is a commentary on our own propensity to become overcome by the valleys of life to the extent that we lose hope of ever scaling the mountains. Sarah maintained her general pious belief in God's existence, but by this time in her life she had totally lost faith to trust that God's power and God's grace could come directly into her life with a blessing too magnificent for human conceptualization. So Sarah laughed to herself. I hope y'all still in here with me. After I'm worn out, after my Lord is old, shall I then have pleasure. You know that cynicism has infected your faith, number one, when exasperation replaces your expectation. And Sarah laughed and said, I I'm going to have a child after I'm worn out. Sarah confused her weariness for the state of God's energy. And whenever you come to the place where you begin to confuse the fact that you're tired, that you're busted, that you're disgusted, that you're worn out with what your God can do, you know that your faith has been infected by cynicism. I came to remind somebody today that we serve a God who neither gets weary nor does he faint. I don't care how tired you are. Don't you ever think that God is tired. God ain't never as tired as you. He ain't never as broke as you. He's never as busted as you. He's never as disillusioned as you. God does not need a nap or a Red Bull. That just because you are worn out does not mean that God is not still able. Have you not heard? Have you not known that the only wise God neither does he faint or does he become weary. He giveth power to those who are faint. 
Don't you ever think that because you are exasperated that you ought to lose your expectation. In fact, it is when you're at the end of your rope that your faith ought to be the strongest because when you're worn out, that's when God is getting ready to come pick you up and infuse you with energy to keep running on a little while longer. I wish there was somebody here who could testify that when I had lost all of my strength, that's when I found some more strength that was not of this world, but it was strength straight from heaven. Is there anybody here who thought you wouldn't make it, that you couldn't take it, that you couldn't go any further, but right when you didn't have anything else to give, God reached way down and gave you everything you needed to keep pressing on. Don't allow your exasperation to ever replace your expectation. Just because you're worn out does not mean God is worn out. And because God never gets worn out, I choose to believe that God is getting ready to do something that I cannot do. But if I could do everything, I wouldn't need God. So I've learned how to thank God when I'm tired. Because when I'm tired, that means God is somewhere standing by. And I wish there was somebody in here who would give God a tired praise. I'm sick and tired of trying to deal with my household. But since I'm tired, I know that God is leaning near. I'm tired of these Negroes and Negroettes at my job. But when I'm worn out, that's when I can expect help from above. Is there anybody who can thank God that when I'm exasperated, I still have some expectation that the Lord is my helper. So I will not be afraid. I, I still have an expectation. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious of the workers of iniquity. I still have expectation. It keeps me in a place where I refuse to conflate my weariness with how God is able to work. But you know your faith has been infected by cynicism when exasperation begins to replace what you expect God to do. Secondly, you know cynicism has infected your faith when you begin to confuse human capacity for divine capability. Let me say that one more time. You know your faith has been infected by cynicism when you begin to confuse what you can do with the boundaries of what God can do. Whenever human capacity becomes your boundary line for what God can do in your life, your faith has been jacked up by cynicism. Look at what Sarah says. Shall I have a child after I'm worn out? And my Lord is old. At this time, she's talking about Abraham. Abraham was approaching 100 years old. 100 years old is not the time to be having a baby when you're talking about human capacity. Human capacity says that I've got to operate based on my biological clock. Human capacity says that I've got to organize my life based on what I am able to do. But understand, God never uses people who have the total capacity. No, God uses people who he breaks their capacity, expands their capacity, and builds you to be more than what you could ever be without God. Here it is. When you look back over your life, you'll realize that your capacity is really small. But when you're hooked up with God, I wish I had some help in here. God has a way of taking small vessels and pouring something on the inside of them where they have some depth that they would have never had before. God knows how to take cracked vessels and will know how to make them like they're new because God is able to take your human capacity. Your life is not limited on your capacity.
You know why I shout about that? Because it reminds me that God is not on a time clock. That God does not have to operate based on my abilities or based on my human needs, desires, and capabilities. But in fact, God knows how to work outside of that. So that even like Sarah and Abraham, once I am past my years of productivity, God knows how to cause me to be productive. Even when everybody else says it's past my time. <clears throat> I'm trying to help somebody today. Because somebody came to church today thinking that your time is up. But can I share something with you on this Lord today? If God woke you up this morning, you still got time. If you're still in your right mind, you still got time. If you still got some energy and some cognitive ability, God can still do great things through your life. Your time is not up. You know that cynicism has infected your faith. I've got to hurry. It's infected your faith when exasperation replaces your expectation. Cynicism has infected your faith when you confuse human capacity for divine capability. But then you know that cynicism has infected your faith when your bitterness becomes the barometer by which you accept or reject blessings. After I'm worn out, <clears throat> I mean, can't you just hear the attitude in Sarah's voice? After my Lord is old, shall I then have pleasure? Sarah's life had been characterized by bitterness stemming from the fact that in a culture that placed a premium on giving birth to babies, she had none. And Sarah was bitter about it because they kept inviting her to baby showers, but she was never the honoree. I wish I had some help in here. I mean, she kept having to watch other people who were neglectful with their children. And all she wanted was one. She, 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 she saw people have babies on accident. Y'all don't want to talk back to me today. And she couldn't have one on purpose. And as a consequence, Sarah became bitter. And if you're not careful, life will make you bitter. Life will make you callous. Life will cause you to respond even to beauty with anger. She was bitter. So bitter that as God sat in her house and made her a promise, she laughed at him. Her bitterness was the barometer by which she accepted or rejected blessings. That is, if it seemed too good to be true, I don't believe God's going to do that for me. That, that, that she always found something ugly, even in beautiful situations. That she always had something negative to point out. Even when the entire environment was positive. Do you know anybody like that? Bitterness had so characterized her life that even when God was trying to bless her, 
She said, it's got to be too good to be true. And you know that your faith has been infected by cynicism when even good things you find something bad with. You never have any joy. You never have any positivity. Could it be that bitterness has taken such a deep root in your life that even the blessings that God gives you, you don't find a reason to celebrate? Well, I don't know about you, but I've made the decision. I'm not going to live my life bitter. I'm not going to walk around mad because of what happened in my past. God is too good to me. Maybe it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be. Maybe it didn't turn out the way I had planned it out. But God allowed me to live beyond it. And I'm not going to allow the bitterness of my past to infect my future. I wish I had somebody that still believed in spite of what might have happened yesterday, God still has son that's going to come out for tomorrow. And so I'm going to get up every morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad therein. I'm not going to allow bitterness to infect my outlook on life. You know, bitter people can be hard to deal with. You gotta be careful how you deal with bitter people. You can't, you can't internalize everything that a bitter person says to you. God knew that. And so as Sarah is laughing and with that sister girl attitude saying, after I'm worn out, after my Lord is old, shall I receive pleasure? God does not even respond to Sarah. But God starts talking to Abraham. A. Why is Sarah laughing? I mean, Abraham, what did I say that was funny? I, I, don't, I don't understand why I'm hearing laughter. It seems like I should be hearing shouting, but what's so funny? And then, then God begins to speak in third person. He slides next to Abraham. Man to man, a eh? is there anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, I mean, God is talking to Abraham about himself. And every now and then, God will slide up next to you and begin to remind you about who he is. Because whenever you become too intoxicated by who you are, God will slide next to you and remind you, I am the great I am. I am the lily of the valley. I am the bright and morning star. I am the bridge over troubled water. I am the way in no way. Don't forget who I am. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, I know that there are some sicknesses that are too complex for the physician, but is there anything too hard? I mean, I know that there are some cases that are too, uh, too complex for the lawyer, but is there anything? Too hard for the God who's never lost the case. I, I know, I know that, that there are some heights that are too high for the hiker to reach. But is there anything? There, is there, I know there are some depths that are too low for the excavationist to plumb. But, but, but is, there, is there anything too hard? I know that there are some aspects of God that are too lofty for the theologian. But there are some secrets of biology that are too advanced for the scientist. 
that there are some ideas that cannot be grasped by the intellect. That there are some mysteries of the modern mind that the psychologist has not unwoven. But is anything too hard for God? Is there any sin that God can't forgive? Is there a heart that's so broken God is not able to mend it? Is there destruction too severe that God cannot bring order to it? Is there anything too hard for God? Well, I'm glad to report that regardless of what might be too hard for you, that if you serve my God, that there is nothing too hard for God. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but whatever it is that you're struggling with, you need to understand that God is still able to handle your problem. As a matter of fact, you ought to get somebody by the hand. You ought to shake it real good and tell a neighbor if it's too big for you, it's just right for God because there is nothing too hard for God. That wasn't the right name, but get somebody else and tell them you go on to sleep tonight. Ain't no need in you pacing the floor and tossing and turning. God neither sleeps nor does he slumber. If he's going to be awake, you might as well go on and take yourself to sleep. There's nothing. There's no child that he can't bring home. There's no family that he can't put back together. There's no hopelessness that he cannot fill. There's no void that he cannot provide for. There's no need that he doesn't have riches for. There is nothing too hard. There's no mountain that he can't help you climb. There's no valley that he won't help you tunnel through. There is nothing too hard for God. Is there anybody here that's glad you serve a God today who really can do anything but fail? There is no failure in God. Is there anybody here that really believes God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you might ask or think? Is there anybody in here that can celebrate a God who nothing is too hard for God? Well, I remember how the old folk would say it, have you any rivers that seem uncrossable? Have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through? God specializes in things thought to be impossible and he can do what no other power is able to do. I just want to encourage somebody today that he really is able to do. He's able to do what everybody else says can't be done. He's able to pay your bill. He's able to dry your tears. He's able to regulate your mind. He's able to give ease to your troubling heart. Ain't he able? Have you tried him? Is there anybody here that can look back over your life and see the places that were too rough for you and now you ought to lift up holy hands and tell the Lord thank you that when it got too rough for me it was just right for you thank you that in the midst of my brokenness you put me back together because there is nothing yes too hard for God yes sir I said there's nothing too hard for God he's able yes he is able 